freedom, a world that works for all. And my talk this morning in following that uh, theme is freedom from fear. Now, yeah, I know I'm going to speak about our dear friend fear here. You know? <laughs> and we know what that stands for, right? We know what fear stands for? Ah, uh -huh, gotcha, gotcha. It stands for feeling everything's awful real. <laughs> oh, yeah. You thought I would say false evidence appearing real. That's what we like to say. And you know, that may be a more accurate description, but too often in the moment, we really do feel that everything's awful real. Our founder of religious science, Ernest Holmes, mentioned in his book, Power for Good, if we allow fear to implant contradictory pictures in our thoughts, we allow them parking spaces in our mind. And I thought that was a very interesting quote, parking spaces in our mind. So it prompted me to think about that. How much of our mental parking space, our parking lot in our minds, how much of that space is filled with spaces labeled reserved for fear park here? <laughs> and did we gather those spaces along the way, or did we inherit some of them? Are we so overpowered, overpowered by our fearful thoughts that we even offer valet parking? <laughs> now, I don't know about you, but I think valet parking is a wonderful luxury. When I go someplace, if I'm traveling, if I'm attending something, I think, wow, this is great. All we have to do is to get out of the car, let somebody else take it away, do the parking for us, and we can shift the responsibility and the care and keeping of our fearful thought to someone else. So when we call valet parking for our fearful thoughts, we're just shifting that responsibility for our fearful thoughts to someone else. Maybe that space is just waiting for somebody else to use it, not us. You know, that reminds me of an experience that my friend Wayne had. He was coming back from a business trip. And he was dragging his luggage, and he was dog-tired, and he couldn't find his car, and he was walking along. And he really didn't pay a lot of attention. And all of a sudden, there was this big black car that pulled up next to him, rolled down the window, and said, get in. Well, Wayne's a pretty sturdy guy, and he was a little bit intimidated by that experience. So he said, no, no, no I'm, I'm good. I'm getting in my car. And the window rolled down further, and the guy said, get in. So now Wayne's looking all over, hoping that there's somewhere a security guard in the, in the parking lot. He can't find anybody. He's just about to get into a dead run as much as he can with his bags and his fatigue. And the guy pulls over, throws open the door, and he said, no, no, no. He said, please, please, just get in. I've been driving up and down for two hours, and I really want your parking space. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a scary story with a happy ending. <laughs> and you know, we might all do well to give away our reserved, our reserved fearful thought parking spaces. And you know, the real problem with uh, parking fearful thoughts is that they never really go anywhere. That's right, that's why it's called park. <laughs> Dr. Holmes said contradictory thoughts in that quote that I mentioned. Now the truth of being is that we are whole, complete, and perfect. So fearful thoughts oppose that truth, right? And when we are in fear, we can't really feel whole because we're feeling separated from the truth. So we first have to be in wholeness with ourselves and the fearful thoughts that create the illusion of separation, the illusion of things not being okay, but the illusion of things being awful real can cause a shift in our perception that makes it seem even more truthful that what the condition is is what we're really experiencing and what's really real. And we live our lives based on fear until we realize the truth of our being. But you know, there's a lot of fearful thoughts in the world. A lot of fearful thoughts floating around. 
And I was reminded this morning of that very thing when I saw it on the news. Sometimes we don't like to look at things that are uncomfortable, but we're going to do that for just a minute because I think it's really valuable. So I saw all the uh, ice raids that were being planned and the immigrants who are living in terror and fear and have been for at least a week now because they announced well in advance that the ICE officers were coming to find them and they were going to weed them out. Now those immigrants who live in fear, and I'm not, I'm not here to talk about whether it's okay or whether it's not okay about what they're doing. We're not talking about judgment and opinion and political and ideas. What I want to talk about is the feelingness of fear. I want us to think about what it really feels like to have that kind of fear, to know that everything that you gave up in a country that you came from, because we're all immigrants, you know, we're all from immigrants. What you gave up in a family, in a community that you were brought up in and came here to find in freedom is now going to be threatened. And maybe you didn't do it the right way. Was it any different for the Jews in the concentration camp and the gay people during Hitler's regime that were scooped up and taken away from their families and friends? What kind of paralyzing fear is it to live knowing or thinking or believing that someone can take away your freedom? I don't want to throw a big cold water blanket on everybody, but I think that it's worth us taking a look at how we really deal with our fears and how can we move away from our fears and how do we move past race consciousness collective thought that creates that kind of fear that is so paralyzing at times in all of our lives and maybe maybe we just have a fear of spiders or we have a fear of snakes or we have a fear of broccoli <laughs> we have residents who are afraid of broccoli um, the idea is, is that if we have fearful thoughts, if we buy into the fear, if we live in that fear, we're really using valuable real estate in the parking lots of our minds that could be filled with other thoughts, with other actions, with other beliefs, that with the truth of our being. And sometimes we play games with our fear. We stick them over here and we say, oh yeah, that doesn't exist, it's okay, I'm, I'm going to ignore that. Sometimes we even do better games than that, you know. We have to consider old Earl, he's driving down the street, he's late for a business meeting and he's scared and he knows that he's maybe not going to do the best presentation of his life and that he might just not make the meeting even because he can't find his parking, well, parking space. So he's looking up at the sky and he said, oh Lord, if you just find me a parking space, I promise I'll give to a charity every week for the rest of my life. And he's still driving. He said, and, and I'll even give up drinking. I'll give up alcohol. <laughs> and so suddenly, a parking place appears. He maneuvers right into it. And he says, never mind, Lord, I got one. <laughs> <laughs> How often do we play those games? No? How often do we play, let's make a deal with our fears? Now, we may not remember. We may, not, we may or we may not include spirit in, in our thoughts and our activities with those kind of deals. But do the games we play ever really help us clean out those fearful thought parking spaces? You know, our thoughts, our thoughts are our most valuable possessions. How we tend them is so incredibly important. And through all the sacred scriptures in the world, this has been documented so well. From the Amrita Hindu Upanishad, it's a Hindu text, we read, it is indeed the mind that is the cause of men's bondage and liberation. And from the Bhagavad Gita, also a Hindu writing, for him who has conquered the mind, the mind is the best of friends. But for one who has failed to do so, their mind will be the greatest enemy. What if we were to inventory our parking spaces and decide to reassign those fearful spaces to the short-term area? I mean like really short-term, where you don't even have to pay when you punch the ticket, you drive in and out so fast. 
Dr. Holmes said, we live our lives based on fear until we realize the truth of our being. And that fear is the positive acceptance of that which we dislike. The positive acceptance, fear is the positive acceptance of that which we dislike. And then he went on to say that faith is the positive acceptance of that which we like. What do you think it would be if we all recognized that fear and faith are the same energetic being used in different ways. One builds us up, one tears us down. Well, I'm here to tell you today that we can and should be free of fear. We should be able to live life as it's meant to be lived, in wholeness, in joy, in love. So how do we get there? Well. We often define fear as the absence of love. That's kind of a standard terminology in our teaching. And in those moments of fear, in those moments of fear, we can turn, we can return to divine love. We can call that ballet attendant and say, hey, bring up the love bug. I want to see that one out of the space. Now, do you remember Herbie? <laughs> Herbie the love bug? Oh, yes. Okay. So, so how is it possible to be fearful with the image of that little smiling flower BW bug driving up to bring you a thought of love? Mm -hmm. To make that turn, to bring up from your parking area a wonderful thought instead of the scary thing. There's no question that love is the healing ball. It's the universal remedy for everything. And again, throughout the scriptures, we find love as the relief that all humanity is seeking. And I would offer a little story here. If, if we could just dismiss any squabbles that we have with the idea, the ideas and the protocols and the teachings of uh, Christian bureaucracy, and just take a simple look and a great message from a man called Jesus who walked so many times ago, many years ago. His purpose for being here was to bring a message of a creator who was filled with love, a creator that so loved everything, everyone. Didn't matter who they were. Didn't matter how many bad things they had done. They were loved, and that was his single message. And his purpose for being here, I believe, was to bring a message that took away a creator that was mean, angry, unjust, waiting always, vengeance is mine, I shall repay. Those were the teachings from the early Hebrew Bible. Many of us were taught those things now. No, Jesus brought the teaching God was love, that God is love, and that everyone is loved equally, no matter who they are. He didn't show any preference for anyone as he walked this world. He was a Jew, and yet he was disliked by his own people. He was criticized, he was persecuted, because they were afraid of this message of love. They were absolutely afraid of it. And the rabbinical elite, the priests, they were really afraid of him, and they really disliked him. <coughs> and yet he knew love so deeply, so organically within himself, that love that's within each and every one of us that's there, that divine essence of love, he knew that so well within himself that he didn't care. He walked without fear, giving his message to anyone who wanted to hear it, to performing seeming miracles based on that message through his love. He performed miracles. He turned many, many, many of those parking spaces of fearful thoughts of many ancient peoples away from an angry creator to the positive acceptance of a loving creator. And you know, Lord Buddha said, hatred does not cease by hatred, but only life, only love. This is the eternal rule. Hatred ceases only by love. And an interesting fact is that the Charter of the United Nations includes the four freedoms that are the rights of every, every living being. And the fourth 
his freedom from fear anywhere in the world anywhere in the world is the right for the freedom from fear it's our divine right to rise above fear and every fear can become a faith as we confront it transcend it and transform it divine flow releases fear and the infinite divine flow of perfect love that's available to each and every one of us, wow, that's got the power to absolutely transform every parking space into ease and a joy for living life to the fullest. And every one of us, every one of us is the recipient of that. There isn't anything special we have to do but open to it. So don't you think it's about time to call the universal tow truck? <laughs> Get them to come out, and you know those vehicle call, the vehicles come in every make and model known to mankind. And what if we thought of fear as forgetting everything is all right? Just forgetting everything is all right. That's what fear is. We forget everything is all right. Because really, truly, it is. It's as all the way as we see it right now. So is it time to reclaim those valiant, those valuable, valuable premium parking spaces for thoughts that are created and alive with possibility and invigorated with divine love and wisdom and intelligence? Isn't it time? Aren't you tired of having all your parking spaces occupied with other stuff? What do you say we just renovate our mental parking lots? <laughs> and we create lots, we create long-term parking lots filled with the thoughts of peace, thoughts of joy, thoughts of harmony, thoughts of awe, thoughts of infinite possibilities. We live in a creative environment filled with inf infinite <coughs> I loved it when Bucky referenced in that quote, do you think God quit making stuff a billion years ago? No, I don't think so. <laughs> that creative energy is within each of us, and to the extent that we step away from our fears, we have to look at them. We have to uncover them, and we have to be strong enough to say, I don't know that that's really true for me anymore. Is this fear really true for me anymore? Don't be a slave to your fears. Don't be a slave to your fears. We can talk about slavery existing forever and ever and ever through the history of all humanity, but we don't have to live that way anymore. We can live in our truth. And nothing, nothing, nothing can overcome fear like faith and perfect love. So I invite all of us to call the universal tow truck when we have those fearful thoughts. They have been parked in a long-term parking area too long. And that tow truck is available in so many time, in so many ways. We have inspirational reading. You know, Dr. Holmes wrote volumes of books on so many subjects, on so many aspects of his teaching that we enjoy. One of the greatest books that I really, truly enjoy, and one that worked to make the biggest difference in my life, is How to Change Your Life. It's just a small book, How to Change Your Life. It is a wonderful book on how to clean up your parking lot. I guarantee it. If you don't like reading, you can get them on audio and listen to them. And if you're not really into the whole book idea, there's music, there's classes of all sorts of things. There's meditation, there's contemplation, there's visualization. And those may be enough to clear up some of those parking spaces. But then we might find that we've got some of these old rusted vehicles that have been sitting around in there that we can't get them to move even the tow truck isn't working and we have to get a bigger tow truck with bigger chains. And by golly, that's where affirmative prayer comes in. That's when we return 
to the truth of what we know about our ability to transform any situation. And if we can't see a condition clearly, and we can't know our own truth, that's why we have practitioners. And the practitioners are just waiting. We wait to serve you, to help you move through, look up those fears, hold them up in the light, and know the truth of your being regardless of the condition that exists in your life or in your world. We're all available to you. The senior minister here is available to you. Use your resources. Use your resources. Here they are. Whatever they may be. So let's just make room. Let's just make room for all the good, the inspirational and the creative thoughts. Let's welcome the good and open your hearts. Let's open all of our hearts right now, right here, to the idea, to the idea that life is meant to be lived and to enjoy it to, the, to be enjoyed to the fullest. That you, I, everyone in the world around the globe deserves to live in peace, harmony, love, and joy. Every being. And you know I'm reminded of a quote by the French scientist Voltaire. He said, God gave us the gift of life. It is up to us to give ourselves the gift of living well. And only each of us can give ourselves the gift of living well. So I want to leave you with this thought from Christian Larson. Now, Christian Larson was a, an ingenious metaphysician in the old days. He's, he was one of the predecessors of New Thought. He wrote tons of stuff about New Thought. And in fact, uh, he's credited, credited by Horatio Dresser, who is a great, uh, great, great grandson of somebody else in New Thought. He did a lot of historical stuff about being the founder of the New Thought movement, Christian Anderson, or Christian Larson, I guess. But the talk about Horatio Dresser and all that is for another day. So I just want to share with you that Christian wrote the Optimist's Creed. Now you can go online and look at it and see the whole mm -hmm. thing. But the Optimist Creed starts with this statement. Promise yourself to be so strong that nothing, nothing can disturb your peace of mind. Let's say that together. I promise myself to be so strong that nothing can disturb my peace of mind. Let's do it again. I promise to be myself to be so strong that nothing can disturb my peace of mind. How does that feel? How does that feel? Do you feel the difference? To move from the constriction of fear into that promise of being free? Nothing can disturb your peace of mind. It's clear your parking spaces are open. And you can have valet parking for all the good thoughts. You can have valet parking for all of the creative thoughts. For all the thoughts of love and joy and wisdom and harmony. And as you make that promise, as you make that promise to yourself, live in faith, trust, and love, and know that you are fully, fully supported by, through, and in the love of spirit in which no fear can exist. Thank you. If you'll join me in a prayer, I'd like to do what we do in our teaching best, and I'd like to I'd like to close this little message with a prayer for freedom of all kinds for everyone. So just bringing ourselves to center in the presence of the divine and calling to mind that one love, that one infinite power, that one that created everything that we see in the seen and the unseen. I know that it created in freedom, it created in love, it created in joy, it created in harmony, everything that is in existence today. And I call forth that peace, harmony, and joy for everyone in this room, for everyone everywhere, 
And I include our family and friends who are not with us today, who are traveling, who are on vacation. I include everyone <coughs> who is without the sound of my voice, not in reach. I include everyone who anywhere around the globe, anywhere, has called out in prayer, seeking help and assistance to move through their fear, to move through the time in their moment of life where things look to be so very real that they can't see that they are free and that they are loved. And so in this moment, I affirm for everyone the great love that exists within each of us as individuals, that exists collectively as we come together in harmony, clearing out those spaces of fear in our parking lots, bringing in the thoughts of joy, love, and harmony, and knowing, knowing that there is a power for good that we can use every minute of every day. And I claim that for each of us here and for everyone around the world. And I accept it as the truth, and I declare it to be so. And I give such great good thanks, knowing the truth of being for every beloved creation of source. And in this moment, I simply release these words directly into the law of mind that always says yes, for I know they're already done. Together we can anchor them by simply saying, and so it is.